I actually care about solving their problems. If I can go into a company and after working with us, fix their messaging and now they're selling is more effective. I really get excited about that. So when I say passionate at two levels, I think passionate about helping other people solve their problems and passionate about what you do. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero episode, and I'm excited to have back with us Tim Pollard. And you may remember Tim from Mastering Communication in a Virtual World, where he unpacked so much wisdom and knowledge for us. So we asked him to come back to join us to share his personal story. Again, he's the CEO of Aradium, and he's worked with companies like Disney, Cisco, IBM, LinkedIn. It goes on and on. He's got two wonderful books, The Compelling Communicator, Mastering the Moment, and Tim, welcome. How are you doing today? Uh, I am doing well. Thank you very much. It's fun fun to be back with you guys. Absolutely. Enjoyed, enjoyed the, the first conversation so much. And we love to get these uh, hero episodes going, Tim, with just telling us a little bit about your journey. Sure. Well, I, I, I hate the word hero. I'm, I'm not a hero. I'm just a guy that gets up in the morning and tries to do a good job and be a good dad and a good husband. And I, don't, I hope that's not a hero. That ought to be what we all aspire to. Well, that's, um, a, that's a hero in my books, Tim. So you're off to a good start. <laughs> well, that's kind. Um, you know, I, I, it is interesting. I have these questions got me to reflect a little bit. I mean, I, I think my journey is interesting in the sense that I've always been obsessed by communication. Why does it work? when it works? Why does it not work when it doesn't work? Why do so many people communicate so poorly, even though it's just so important? And I think that that's always been buzzing around like a subroutine in my mind. So I've always been working on, I've always worked on my communication skills and practices. So I think that's, that's kind of the first part of it. It's just been like a, a splinter in my mind to quote the matrix, you know, um, I think the second interesting thing is for, a, for about a dozen years, I worked for a major consulting slash research firm. And one of the things we did was these big sort of strategy studies. And then my job was to turn the research into a presentation for our members that would often be heads of sales, heads of marketing, even CEOs. And, and, and we would put together, you know, four, five, six hour presentations, full day meetings I just give you a sense of that. These were actually scripted, but that was for reasons I won't get into. But these were 38, 39,000 word scripts. So these were huge things. And at the time, you know, these kind of presentations violated everything that people taught you about presentations. I mean, you, you've been taught you can't hold someone's attention for more than 15 minutes. And, and so you had this enormous gap between what we were told in theory was possible and what we were trying to do. So I think that really drove me even deeper into the question, well, is it possible to communicate effectively you know, over a really long period? And, and that eventually got me to perhaps the third piece of what, what I think became the most important part of everything that I've done is, is finally getting to the realization that the key to communication is the brain. It, it's all to do with the brain. The brain loves certain kinds of information and will attach very well to it. And the brain hates other types of information and will detach very quickly. So for example, you might say, well, you can't hold someone's attention for more than 20 minutes. And that's common page one, of chapter one of most books on communication. But let me ask you a question. I actually will ask you this question. Uh, certainly I'll ask this in a class if we teach it live. What's the longest you've ever binged watch something? How many hours? Not for me personally, not that long. I, I don't. I don't have that much of attention span. Yeah, and that's uh, well. That's the question, though. For most people, sheepishly, they'll go, "Oh, three or four hours." You know, six episodes of Big Bang Theory or Brooklyn Nine Nine. That's three hours right there. And then there are people who will go, oh, "18 hours." The, the conventional wisdom that people have short attention spans actually turns out not to be true. Most people have binge watched things for multiple hours. And what you realize is when communication is structured the right way, 
when it's doing something that the audience likes or wants to engage with, it's perfectly possible to engage with them. So I, the last decade of my journey has really been about trying to understand how the brain works and understand how if you tie communication to the way the brain works, you can be very, very successful. And that led me to all kinds of interesting places, understanding Shakespeare, understanding stand-up comedy. There's little rules, little nuggets to do with communication that show up in all kinds of weird and interesting places. Why do we remember Shakespeare when we don't really remember any other authors from the Middle Ages? And it's often to do with the way he wrote being so well aligned with how the brain likes its information. People don't really realize that. The reason Shakespeare's sticky is he wrote in a brain sticky way, which is really interesting. So I think I'm just a curious person. And by, you know, vacuuming up all these weird, random, disconnected things and putting them together in one place, that's how we ended up with a, a model for communications that really works. It's been sort of a lifelong journey. And I don't think it'll ever end because just as I thought we were finished, then COVID happened, and now we've got to figure it all out all over again for a virtual world, which is what we talked about last time. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious with COVID and the impact, you know, how has that impacted your business and, and how are you guys pivoting and the requests, you know, are the requests changing from the market that you typically serve? I think like a lot of people, I would, I would say we saw three eras. The era one when COVID hit, which was sort of March till June, we just, that was just zombie apocalypse, right? People are in shock. Everything shut down. Like, what is this? I mean, is everyone going to be dead in six months? You know, is it World War Z or something like that? Then I think the second period was interesting. It was like, okay, everyone isn't going to die. We just have to wait till things get back to normal. And that was sort of May through August. And then I think the real second big change happened, which was we're not going back to normal. This is the world we're going to be in at least through the full rollout of a vaccine. Of course, back in August 2020, there was really no knowledge of when the vaccine would happen. Obviously, we know more now. Um, and people realize this is actually the new normal. If you look at, uh, I think there are already several indicators that COVID did not change the future of sales or industry or communication. It accelerated the future that was already coming. There's very few companies are going to go back to most of their meetings being live. They're going to stay virtual. We see this already, large retailers talking this way, industrial buyers and so on and so forth. So we took a pretty big hit in the zombie apocalypse because people just stopped doing anything. Then there was a bit of a wait and see moment when people said, well, we, I mean, people were saying to us, we don't think we need to train our people in virtual selling. We'll just wait for the world to come back to life. And then right almost almost at the same time, it actually started right around July 4th and then onwards. Then the phones just started ringing like this is this is the new normal, isn't it? Like, yep, this is the new normal. You need to figure out how to sell virtually. So we rolled out our, you know, mastering the, the virtual sales conversation resource late summer. And actually, our business took off. I mean, we in, in early 2021, this will probably be the best quarter we've ever had and it's all built out this mostly the consulting and the e-learning around designing and delivering the virtual sales conversation because people have now realized this is the new reality we're going to have to deal with um it's still going to be a virtual world from a right. business standpoint almost certainly now speak to that a little bit further a lot of people when they think of sales they, they have certain perceptions in their mind uh, and now it's shifted to, you know, virtual sales and virtual engagements. You know, if there are myths out there around the virtual world that maybe are, aren't accurate or something you'd like to debunk, is there anything around that that you'd like to speak to? I think there's a general historical misunderstanding of sales, that people think of sales. And all you need to be is I, and a phrase I just despise, you know, the gift of the gab. You know, just a really smooth, slick talker. Talker, that's right. Yeah, and, and I think there's a, a horrible caricature of sort of the used car salesman. And and even today, those people exist, and they're really sleazy. And that that's not what sales is. Great salespeople are thoughtful. 
they prepare well, they plan, they never waste a good customer conversation. There's good data that shows overperforming salespeople are people who overweight pre-call prep. Smart people, they understand their customer, they think through their customer's problem, they, they think through how what they do solves the problem of the customer, not just show up and talk about features and benefits. Um, so I, I've always thought sales a very intellectual, thoughtful profession. It does have a social dynamic that is interesting. Uh, I think that the social dynamic that you would layer onto that skill set is this uh we talked about this on the first conversation right the the ability to read how a customer is responding to your conversation and adjust to it i think that is a very distinct part of sales you can be a great hr exec you can be a great it exec and not need that skill but in sales there's this complex dance this complex dynamic between buyer and seller so you take all of those attributes of smarts, thoughtfulness, intentionality, preparation, those are keys in sales. And then add to that a strong social IQ. That's, I think, what sales is about. And it's as far from the cheesy new car salesman as you can possibly be. Then the final thing is what, what happens to that in the virtual world? I think... To that, you have to add a certain intentionality and mastery to the virtual environment. So like we said, somebody who's even very, very good at sales, if they just breeze up to their laptop, turn on the camera and think that they can do all the same things they used to do, they're 100% wrong. And I would point people back to that first conversation. There are very practical simple things they can do, like where you have your laptop and what time of the day to have your meeting right down to some much deeper things. How do you structure the conversation? How do you design questions to draw the customer out? So I think there's an intentionality around adapting to the virtual world, which would be the new skill that I would now overlay to my traditional thinking of, of what great salespeople are. I love salespeople. They have such a hard job to do, and it is so complex, and it interweaves so many skills that other professionals don't have to have i'm not saying it's harder than yeah. other professional jobs but it's a complex tapestry of skills and i have more respect for salespeople than almost any other profession because add to that these are guys who are willing to take a target these are men and women who are willing to put a target on their back and say i will hit that target or die trying but there's nobody i love more than salespeople, and, and you take that skill set now you add the uh, ability to work in a socially sterile environment. It, it's just fascinating to me. Well, how about, you know, speak to the, the, the listener out there that maybe they're, they're early in their career, they're considering a career in sales and they want to come in. You know, you, you have a, a, so much insight here. Any advice for, for what they should do, particularly now with the things that change so much? I mean, firstly, I think it's what I just said. I think if you were considering a, a job in sales, there are certain things you, you'd have to be comfortable carrying a target and, and you have those great moments of, of elation and triumph when you land a deal or, or hit your number. And then there are moments of challenge when you're climbing a tough hill. And I don't think dentistry has that. I mean, I think, I think that you've got a certain amount of uh, courage that, that goes into that. I do think if I'm considering a career in sales, I, I need to ask the question, not do I have the gift of the gab? Am I a great communicator? But much more, am I thoughtful? Am I willing to do the prep? Am I willing to think about this customer before I, I walk in rather than the classic gunslinger motif, you know, walking in, hey, you know, how's it going? And looking for the low hanging fruit. So I, I think there are uh, understanding sales and say, am I well fitted to that? I think a lot of people are better fitted to sales than they realize because they misunderstand what it is. They think it's all about being a good talker, which it's not. I think the other thing as well is you, you, you would want to make sure that you are passionate. And I think passionate at two levels. I mean, actually passionate about meeting people, getting to know them, learning how to solve their problems uh, or, or passionate about solving their problems. When I, when I meet with new clients, I am so passionate. I actually care about uh, solving their problems. If I can go into a company and after working with us, fix their messaging, and now they're selling 
is more effective. I really get excited about that. So when I say passionate at two levels, I think passionate about helping other people solve their problems and passionate about what you do. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't sell lawn sprinklers, but I, I doubt I would be especially passionate about helping people have a greener lawn. Now, you might be passionate about that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It just wouldn't necessarily get me up in the morning. But I'm incredibly passionate about helping people be more effective in their sales, helping small companies grow. You know, we'll have a lot of small companies come to us. We help them fix their selling, particularly their sales messaging. And those companies are now on a better trajectory. And that really gets me up in the morning or a client as big as IBM or Cisco, where we can meaningfully move the needle. So I think if, if you're not passionate about something, do something else. Go work with dolphins. That's you know, right. That's right. Fig, figure out how to grow better vegetables or go work for a nonprofit and drill wells in Africa. But but to anyone, regardless of age or stage or sales, it's like if you're not passionate about what you do, you only get one life and you don't get any do-overs. So be passionate about what you do. Be excited about it. And if it means taking some risks, then take some risks. Right. You know, but but if you're not passionate about what you do, really, there's no point in doing it. No doubt. I mean, and speak to that passion when when you're in those moments where you feel like you, you, you are doing the work that you were called to do. You know, what are you doing specifically when you're finding yourself the, the most fulfillment? What are you doing in those moments? You know, it's interesting. Some of the most fulfilling moments for me, and obviously landing a deal is a great thing. You know, I'll, I'll have a conversation. It's a web-based conversation. This is for a big deal with a you know, Fortune 100 company, and, and they are... They place their trust in you at the end of this. They're like, hey, we really want to work with you guys. We think you can help us. That itself is just a wonderful moment where you know, they put their trust in you and you, you've achieved what you wanted to achieve. And obviously for me being a CEO of a small company, that, that means I can continue to make payroll and I can provide 20 families with a job and benefits. And so there's a lot of reward in that. I think the intellectual reward for me often is actually fixing somebody's messaging. You know, it, it's done more virtually now than it used to be, but you'll have a client and they sort of know what problem they solve for the customer and they sort of understand their own value prop, but they get, they get tripped up around becoming too sender oriented. They, they, they get tripped up around talking too much about themselves. Um, they, they get tripped up about getting into sort of features and functions rather than really understanding, articulating value. And you sit down with them and you hear them talk. And then you, there's this lovely moment for us where we say, look, I think it's this, right? This is the customer problem. This is what's causing it. This is how it's then manifesting. And this is how it's hurting them. And then this is how you solve this problem for them. And this is why your solution is better than anyone else. And they look at you and go, how did you do that? How did you do that? And I said, well, often it's just a, an odd gift of what I would call synthesis, which is I heard you talk enough about the customer and I heard you talk about your solution. Eventually, I was able to put it together into a story. And, and that's just an unusual gift that some people have, perhaps. It can be learned because we, we teach our customers to do it all the time. I remember, actually, we built a safer schools message for a technology company. So as a technology company that uh, has a lot of different technologies. They can have cameras in schoolyards. They can have a direct connection using AI that if a camera picks up a, an image of a gun, for example, it can detect that image using artificial intelligence, not having somebody see it. And it can automatically send a signal to law enforcement. There's no human interaction. This is so cool. And they just... They just didn't know how to tell the story. And, and when we sat down with them and said, well, this is how you would tell that story. That to me is like, it's like a rush. Uh, you mentioned the word flow and I'm familiar with that book. That's sort of when you're in that point of optimum flow and they go, wow, that's really good. And then you go away and you finish the message and you take it out to different school districts and lo and behold, it really, really works. And that's just a great moment. I get excited about fixing people's messaging or help them design an amazing TED talk right. or design how they're going to tackle a job interview. Th those things just get me up in the morning because that's my passion. Very cool. Very cool. Let's uh, take a, a turn off the career and talk a little bit outside of work. So anything you enjoy doing for a hobby? 
<laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I have a lot of hobbies, actually. I live in Montana, so I'm a pretty serious fly fisherman. I hike and I camp and I fly fish. I'm, I'm pretty good at that. I tend to be try and be good at the things I care about, like a lot of people. And I'm you know, a solid tennis player, and uh, I like windsurfing also. If you Google windsurfing in Montana, you don't really get any hits. But if you have a wetsuit and you're willing to get cold, that can be good. So, <laughs> you know, I, I sort of eclectic. I like to cook and, and other things. And I, I love biking. I mountain bike. I think I get bored doing one thing. So I, mm-hmm. I kind of keep I keep cycling between things. So I'll, I'll leave golf alone for a while. Then I'll come back and I'll golf again. So, so right now it's sort of biking, tennis and fly fishing are sort of my main things. So it's a lot, a lot of activity. So are you doing a lot of, of, you know, what forms of exercising with bike or is it more just pleasure, leisure riding, things like that? Uh, It's a bit of everything. I, I, I find those things uh, clean up my hard drive a little bit. They allow me to relax. I'll go to the gym as often as I can. I, I'm pretty good with that. But but I like biking and being on the outdoors, getting the exercise and, and the experience. And I have four kids that keep me pretty busy and a pretty active church, church life that keeps me busy. That's all changed under the virtual environment. But yeah, I, I do stay fairly busy, like a lot of people. No doubt. I mean, that, that leads us right into, you know, we love to hear about our families, of our heroes, and, and through these conversations. Anything you'd like to share about your family with us? You know, I've just been very blessed with a great family. We, uh, My wife and I had our 30-year wedding anniversary last June, which was a complete catastrophe. It was great. So we were meant to go on this big trip to go to South America, where we, we actually do a, it's a non-profit there that we work with. We were going to visit them, so that didn't happen. So we ended up going to Glacier National Park, and it's a seven-hour drive. And as we show up, they close the park because there was too much COVID on the Native American reservation. So we drive seven hours, and as we turn away from the park, which is closed, I didn't even know they could close national parks, we get a phone call from our daughter, and our dog was dying. So we sort of did a FaceTime with our beloved rugby, our chocolate lab. So. So at the world's worst 30th wedding anniversary. So we're going to try and do a do over in 2021. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. And then just four great kids all doing their own thing. Uh, son in relief work, humanitarian work. My, one of my daughters works for us doing <clears throat> a lot of marketing and product development. And then a son doing finance. And then a daughter in college doing biology and zoology and ethology, study of animal behavior. So a pretty eclectic group of kids. Wow. So is there <laughs> everybody pretty local or, or on that, that side of the country or spread out? Yeah, pr- pretty spread out. Uh, Rose is in San Diego. Fergus is in Bozeman, whereas I'm in Billings. That's a couple of hours away. Angus was in Bangladesh working with the Rohingya. Then he went to Yemen um, working with refugee camps there. He's now working in Flagstaff supporting Navajo Nation's uh, COVID relief efforts. So he's doing some great humanitarian work. Oh, that's great. That is, and thank you so much for sharing, you know, about your family. We love, we love to hear about that on our episodes here. And mm. uh, in, anything that you consume, like podcasts, YouTube, books, I, I know you have two wonderful books you have yourself, but that you think our listeners may, you know, find va- uh, value in? Yeah, you know, it's pretty eclectic. I mean, I, I love Malcolm Gladwell's uh, revisionist history. He goes back and looks at things that have happened in history and why we don't understand them the way we thought we did. So I think that's quite brilliant. Uh, I like Planet Money. It's very interesting just about how the the economics of the world work, which is good. Um, A pretty big reader. I've read some great books. Uh, I love a guy called Alain de Botton. I think he's the most brilliant writer. He's very much of a philosopher. He is, in fact, a philosopher. He's English, actually, although he's of uh, uh, Swiss descent, I believe. Um, but he wrote a book called The Art of Travel. Um, it's about why we travel and what it does for us in our souls. And it, it, it's a book you can read about one page at a time, and then you have to sort of lie down in a dark room. So it's just it's a book I tend to recommend to everybody. And he, his writing is really beautiful, I think. Um, it really makes you think. And so I just, I, I've reread that book a lot of times. I like all of his books though. Um, he's got a great book about work and, and fulfillment from work called Status Anxiety. And that's a great book also. Okay. 
Very great. Well, thank you for sharing that information with us. And we started doing a, a, a fun thing, Tim. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Just, we call it the lightning round. Just a bunch of random silly questions uh, just to get yeah. our listeners to know a little bit more about you. So, so if you're willing to play, we'll, uh, we'll go through that. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what you're going to get, whether you can use it on air, but I'll try. <laughs> well, very good. We'll start, we'll start with softballs. Any favorite food? I'm English. So Indian food. Yeah. Indian food in England is to die for. It's almost impossible to get amazing Indian food in the States. It's just not a specialty here, but it's so nuanced and interesting that I, I if I go to England, I'll eat the curry every single night which is not always the nicest for people who are hosting me, but it's a great thing for me, nonetheless. I hear you. I hear you. So, <laughs> threw me off with that one. So uh, how about shows or movies? Any any personal favorites? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I'm 59 years old, so I fit that demographic of guys that study World War II, like I have to take a test on it. Um, uh, I love the movie Das Boat. It's a, a long movie about a German U-boat in World War II and uh, movies like The Battle of Britain and an amazing movie called The Dam Busters. So I think those are favorites. I share a real passion for the movie Dodgeball with my son, uh, Fergus. Occasionally, he and I will just get into a text war of naming lines from the movie Dodgeball. But um, right. I think my number one favorite would be Das Boat. By the way, a movie came out a couple of years ago or last year called Midway, and everyone's anticipation of it would it be really Hollywood and it wouldn't be historically accurate. I think it turned out that it was incredibly accurate to what really happened historically, and it was beautifully made. It was a very good film. So I really enjoyed that, uh, actually, a lot. Yeah, my wife, she's she's a big into the history, and that was one film that stood out to her, so, the, the accuracy of what happened there. So. Um, yeah. with you all the way. So how about, uh, pets? Pets. Yeah. So we, uh, we have dogs, uh, but they keep dying. Um, and, and partly natural causes, but not usually we, you know, we, we, one was hit by a car. That was really sad. And then we had this lovely young, big black Labrador, a big dog, hundred pounds fit as a butcher's dog. I mean, amazingly fit. And he was bit by a rattlesnake and died in Montana, which was very unusual. Uh, we have a cat now. And, and this great story, this cat just showed up under our deck, totally emaciated. Like the vet said she was maybe two or three days away from dying. And she now owns us. This, this cat's called Marmite. This cat just owns us. <laughs> and uh, she's actually curled up on a blanket right next to me right now i hear you she's she's looking at me because this podcast is just a big distraction to right. her sleep. Yeah, but yeah. i sort of simultaneously love cats and dogs which is a bit unusual but you know okay love them there you go how about uh, vacation destinations anywhere you, you and your wife would like to go <laughs> well not glacier um you know I, I think we get our most fun out of just wandering around old cities yeah, when we were younger, you know, we we loved the the beach with our kids and Florida and Disney and all of that. But right now, you're know, wandering around Copenhagen or Amsterdam, sitting out drinking a beer is is probably the thing we most miss about not being able to travel and what we'll we'll get back to later. I don't know. I just love the kind of the history and the architecture and the slower pace. We, we do less activity stuff now and less drinking beer by a canal in Amsterdam is an activity. Well, that, that leads to the last question in lightning round. So favorite adult beverage. Oh, okay. I'm very specific on this one. It, it's scotch, but it's not any scotch. It has to be an Isla single malt scotch. So there's one little Island off Scotland called Isla, I S L A Y it's pronounced Isla. And the, this is the island that smokes its barley over burning peat. And so that, that's the scotches that have that really smoky flavor. It's kind of an acquired taste. You love it or you hate it. And I finally started falling in love with it a couple of years ago. And it's, it's almost literally all I drink now. And if you, if you really come to appreciate it, it it's, I could take an hour drinking just a tiny glass because the flavors are so interesting and so complex. 
and the one you want is the Lagavulin 16 year old and it, it you you could spend all night just trying to identify all the flowers in there just a tiny teaspoon of water in that glass and that just beats out everything else you know I'll drink my beer and whatever but but uh that's that's the drink of champions I think so I was going to ask you so you drink that neat you said with just a little bit of water yeah you you, you should never drink scotch neat Never. If people think oh, it's more manly to drink it meat. No, it's actually not what you do. You have to put a little bit of water in to release the oils and actually release the flavor. If you look at the scotch and put one teaspoon of water and look at the glass, look at what happens. It's amazing. Um, uh, and that will actually release the flavors properly. Um, so you should always do that. Now, if you want to mix it with Coke or soda water, that'd be my guess. But then go buy a five dollar bottle of scotch from the gas station. Right. <laughs> It's not worth spending seventy five dollars on a bottle and then mixing it with with you know with Coke. That's what Jack Daniels is for. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> not to insult, not to insult bourbon lovers. Bourbon's great as well, by the way. Good bourbon's great as well. But I'm sort of a, an Isle single malt guy. Okay, very good. Well, th- that was a fun lightning round. We got to to definitely know <laughs> a little bit more about you, Tim. Thank you for playing along. <laughs> not at all. This has been a, this has been great. Love to love to learn more about you, and we always wrap up Eco Ask Why with the Why, where we speak to the passion. So, you know, Tim, if someone's to come up to you and want to know what your personal why is, what would that be? You know, that's a very interesting question because that's a very philosophical question. Um, I'm going to answer that in an odd way. There's a verse in the Bible which is very dear to me that says, "One day." If all works out right, we get to meet with God and and he's going to say a couple of things, one of two things to you or one of several things. And the Bible says that to certain people, he'll just say, hey, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. And I kind of want to make sure that that's how it ends for me. So if you want a serious question and you want a serious answer, <laughs> you know. I love scotch. And one day I want God to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. There you go. That is a wonderful answer, and I, I I second that with you, Tim, all the way. I, I hope I, I hear those words myself. So uh, <laughs> Good. This has been wonderful. And, and again, for our listeners, we'll link all of Tim's information, all his uh, resources in the show notes. You can check that out. Please go check out his information, buy his material, buy his books. They're, they're wonderful. I just finished reading them both myself. And, uh, Tim, thank you again for taking so much time with us on Eco Ask Why. And not at all. Not at all. It's really fun talking to you guys. I think you're doing a great thing here, providing good, equipping resources to your members and audience. So uh, keep up the good work. We all do well when we try and get smarter. So you're, you're helping there. So thank you for that. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.